let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's Andrew Patrick. He is engineering director at Avenga. He is speaker and also he is head of program committee for Java Day Lviv. Uh, and his area of interest is Java, Big Data, Groovy, Scala, Spring, Dota 2, and Heroes 3. So, Andri, if you are with us, we are welcome you here. I'm Hi. with you. Hi, how are you doing? Oh, it's been a great ride with Victor. I hope you were able to catch up some of his yep. talk. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Victor is, is glorious as usual. And it's, it's always better having him on the conference because he gives so much energy to the, to the audience. Like, uh, probably, probably a few can beat that. <laughs> so everybody has their perks and I hope that, uh, we will get a lot of insights from your presentation as well. But before we jump into that, I've been asking Victor about this, like our main theme of this conference is about AI and is it a friend, a four, like, uh, does it have a potential to become a friend? So like, what's, what's your experience with AI? Do you, do you consider it to be a friend? Um, that's a pretty complicated question. And I'm afraid if I would start answering that, uh, like to full, uh, of my endeavors there, uh, that would probably take another conference talk, but I have written, uh, uh, on the medium, uh, short, like, uh, like just a free text of what I had in mind about that topic. Uh, right now, I don't think it's about friendship or like f being a foe. It's more about what regulations should be applied to AI in our day-to-day -day job and businesses. Because right now, the problem is that the executives and the uh, money holders in the business is uh, striving to get more income with, with that less effort. And right now this field is not regulated by law and that's the empty field and it's really bad situation. Nobody like the employees want to be there. So that's, that's my answer to that question. That's, that's not yet, uh, decided wh whether it's a friend or, or a foe. All right. Thank you for your answer. That's a multi-dimensional question. Yeah, you yeah. know, and <laughs> happy to talk about that, but probably not on this talk. So, no. um, Andrew, good luck to you with your presentation. And I wish you a lot of fun having this presentation to you audience. I wish you a lot of insights from Andrew's talk. And I want to remind you that Yuri will be back with you and my moderation duties are over for today. So I will be just carefully listening to the talk. Good luck, Andrew. Thank you, Mariana. So folks, uh, that's awesome having you here with me and uh, that, that I was allowed to present you some some silly and funny stuff uh, by the end of the day. Uh, after the victory, it's probably important to be, be, be less stressful without all those tests and, and heavy uh, business logic stuff that was happening right before me. So we were talking about the awesome system design. Yeah and everything works. So I believe this was Yuval Noi Harari that uh, at some point of time said that, you know, like our brains function in that way that it is easier for him to track the panther or tiger uh, hiding behind the leaves in the jungle than uh, do a trivial math computation because uh, a threat, a tiger or a panther is uh, much more known issue to the human brain rather than math com computations or any, any sort of uh, calculations that involves numbers and stuff like that. Um, because like that, that, that how the evolution works and that's, uh, how many times we spend with this threats and this new threats, which are numbers, a relatively new concept. So, 
uh, when I was younger, there was a book called uh, Heads First Java, and they take this approach and with something that they consider important in the book, they put some sort of a threat uh, picture to that, a tiger, a lion, uh, whatever. So uh, I decided that uh, the, 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 the new challenges requires like the modern solution. So I decided we wouldn't put a th threat images to important stuff, but we would put a mem images to the important stuff just to get you out of your comfort zone, I hope. Uh, so before we start talking about uh, silly stuff, a little bit of serious stuff, I know you already guys did some donations uh, to the charity, to different sort of charity, but I insist you will do another one because like we can have this talk. I can have this talk right, right, right now here with you just because of the armed forces of Ukraine. So please, if you had any spare coins left, donate them either with this QR code that you can see on the screen that will uh, direct you to the Back in Alive uh, Charity Nations uh, Foundation, sorry, uh, or any other of your choice. There is a plenty. Uh, do that, and we Ukrainians do appreciate that stuff. So get back to the to the funny stuff. Why this topic? Uh, like simply because I am on the right side of this picture. I do not like, I hate life coding interviews. That's the, just something that I see not really, not really valuable, not really feasible to, to do at all. And we'll talk about that later. So I hope you will be on the, on the, on the right. Uh, in, in all meanings of that word, side of these questions by the end of this presentation. Uh, why why me? Why should I talk about that stuff? So you've seen my name. My name's Andrew. You can see it uh, right below the, the picture you're seeing. And I'm working as the engineering director at a company called Avenga. It's a global company uh, with huge offices in Ukraine. So uh, I'm a sort of a manager. And as you all engineers know, the managers does not do any valuable job. So just to justify my existence within the company for a little bit, I do an interviewing process and, and I'm acting as a hiring manager for all the Java, big data and stuff that happenings within the Avenga globally. Uh, so to get better with interviewing uh, many fascinating juries to get to their level. I was thinking, how can I improve myself? How can, how can I invest into myself to understand uh, how to prepare better for the interviews and what to ask on the interviews? So I go in 2022 for the couple of the interviews, just out of curiosity reasons and reasons to improve myself. So that looks like that. So I go to the couple of very famous, very big companies going through different stages and each of this big company I was personally interested in, the process I was interested in, they had both live coding interview and they had a system design interview. And upon my experience there, I've concluded that the system design interview is much more superior to live coding interview. And I want to share the, the, the experience I got with you guys. So beside that fact, as I said, I'm acting as a hiring manager on Avenga, so, uh, from January 2019 till April 2023, I've have conducted roughly 256 interview, which ends up being 1.2 interview per week. And I am trying to incorporate a system design questions of sort into each of them, disregard the level of the candidate. So I believe I have a little bit of a clue what I'm speaking about. And Without a further ado, uh, the background music chills as it kills me every damn time I open this episode uh, by uh, Romero. That's a fascinating Romero. We are entering the city, the city where the system design architecture magic happens. To flow this music for you. That's awesome. So, what we're talking about 
we meet our hero there. Probably if you know the song theme, you know this hero, that's the Sandro. And Sandro wants to become the best engineer this city have ever seen. But, you know, achieving the greatness is not an easy task. So what we had to do to get there? Well, we had to understand why the system design is important in the end. Like the, before that, that was just like my talk, my opinion. Now I'm trying, I will try to, to, to resonate with the facts with you. So first of all, I believe strongly and firmly that system design allows you to assess a problem solving skills. And the interviewer can access your uh, problem solving skill and you can improve your problem solving skills doing the system design. No matter we're talking about the interview process or we're talking about day to day job activities when you design a complex system, a smaller solution, that all require a design phase. You need to imagine how your system or a piece of software will work in the end. So system design allows you to evaluate me as an interview manager uh, and uh, I, I can access if you can evaluate, uh, if you can uh, solve complex projects, if you can break them down into, into chunks that are easy to maintain, easy to explain and develop. Also, it is something uh, that requires a technical knowledge. You cannot speak about some complex solutions when you don't know what the things you're talking about. Uh, and basically, uh, you can learn things here and there, uh, put them together, but every time you, the, the interviewer will ask you the, some questions like on the side of the main course, you will get lost if you do not have a technical base. So it is required for you to know the things you're talking about. And that's the, and that's the real uh, shiny diamond of the system design interview. We can talk about so many things not related to the original questions because it touches so many aspects of a system design interview. And also system design as all in our IT requires uh, good decision-making skills. So you have to decide what things to incorporate into your answer, what th things to not incorporate into your original design or initial design, call it whatever you want. So basically it gives the interviewer the opportunity to understand what you value, how you decide what is valuable, what is not that valuable, and how you can uh, explain yourself, which is very important skill to the, all the engineers, how you can explain yourself doing this stuff and again i believe this stuff is about the day-to-day -day job not the life coding interview because life coding interview is is it is, is freaks me out because many companies like like google it's not a joke it's not the myth they still provide like a google doc to uh, have you uh, a life coding interview how that relates to the your day-to-day -day activities. I bet you don't use anything like that. You don't use Microsoft 365 or Google Doc for writing code day-to-day -day basis. Why you should take away the after completion, why you should take away the suggestion. That's not something that uh, corresponds to your knowledge, to your ability to write the code and, and stuff like that. So I just don't get the point. With the system design, that the, everything is on the table. You do that every day. You design the features, you design the system, depending on the role you occupy. And you do that on the whiteboard, you do that in the notepad, you do that in the draw or scala draw, whatever you like. But you can do that, you can show that on the interview. And that is something you will do as well when you are doing your day-to-day -day activities. So. I believe that is why the system design is that important, no matter which form it takes, the interview or the real day activities. So, but the process of getting to be the best out of best and obtaining new knowledge is nothing without the failures and without making mistakes. If we are not making mistakes, we are not doing that right. And if we are not tired of engineering, we are again, not doing that right. That's how the engineers should look like. And that's how they look like. Uh, 
for, like especially without having two coffees in the morning uh so system design requires so many things you had to take care of and each of the your peers from the management from the qa from the cybersecurity especially will think that their problems and challenges should be the most important things for you to cover in your system design architecture how can it be any other way so you have to deal with those ambiguity with all uh sometimes even uh, not really corresponding requests what to incorporate first what to not incorporate at all and how to deal with all this communication chaos that happens around you so let's walk through the couple of the most popular mistakes that uh engineers does during the system design phase during the interview or not and first and my most beloved is the over engineering thing we all over engineer things from time to time that's that's what we do every day and let's consider a simple scenario when you were asked to design a simple block platform the basic requirements include creating and publishing blog posts allowing users to comment on those posts and displaying a list of recent posts on the home page simple task enough but in response you might propose an overly complex architecture involving microservices message queues and multiple databases because you just can and you also might suggest using distributed system with separate services for user management content storage uh comment management analytics whatever uh, and while this approach is still valuable in the end your system will do what it is required to do uh but it looks like an overkill for the initial requirement when it was a simple block platform how to avoid these things first and most important gather the requirements ask the questions in other words don't rush into writing a design or writing a solution right away even if you're very very sure how it should look like and you know better just ask some some questions rather uh, gather the requirements understand what is really needed right here and right now maybe we will need this complex solution but not right away maybe we'll need it somewhere in the future so that we can uh, predict that we can incorporate that idea of more complex design into our initial design but it's something that is not required right here and right there so you're don't need to rush into microservices and stuff like that right away maybe a monolith is the way to go here and and uh, later build on top of that and decouple those into the microservices why not and also this is a very important thing back of envelope estimation do that every time upon your system design no matter where and when you did it because that gives you a brief idea how much things you need to accomplish the task how much memory you need how many users you will have uh, what type of cpu uh, you will require for your computations and stuff like that you will be able to logically justify type of a database uh, that you'll use if any for your system the use of message queues and stuff like that so do this pretty simple things to avoid of over the complex solutions uh the other question that often rises on the interviews is the scalability of your applications and to design a scalable system is not a trivial thing actually the, uh, because it implies so many aspects the overall architecture it obviously data storage uh, use of different mechanics and tools like caching and load balancing so let's try to solve this puzzle right here so first of all that you should think of is horizontal scaling when you can adopt a strategy to distribute the load of incoming requests to the multiple servers the simple thing involves the load balancer there is a lot of different load balancers you I, I encourage you to read more about all the stacks that that's that's the thing i've mentioned before you need a technical some decent technical knowledge of the things you're talking about and 
learn more about those things. What are the types of load balancer? Uh, what are the strategies of load balancing? How we should distribute requests between different services, between the different uh, microservices and applications. But horizontal scaling is probably the first step into having the scalable applications that allow the highly throughput into your system. Again, interview favorite, a database sharding. Uh, as the user base grows, and there is, and it, it will always happen that the data only will become larger and larger in size. It's important to distribute the data across the multiple database servers to avoid what we all love, the database bottlenecks. And by implementing database sharding, you can do that. You can ensure that each database service will handle only a subset of users or user data, or whatever, and that will eventually enable a better performance and better scalability of your system as well. Uh, caching. Caching is important if you had things uh, like user profiles, feed data, uh, frequently accessed uh, data like POST and ETC, stuff like that. So uh, you, you, the, the names like Redis and the Memcached, I believe, ring the bell in your head because that's the very popular names and that's the very popular caching mechanism, caching tools. So you can use that in distributing system uh, to allow user not to query your uh, databases each time they need some fre uh, uh, frequently accessed data as the one mentioned about so that will help minimize the number of the data queries and will again improve the performance of your application and as well the scalability of your application the cdn if your system had a lot of images media stuff like that that is heavy that is static and it your users uh, are spread across the globe employ CDN, content delivery networks, that will minimize the latency and offload the serving of such content from your application services. And not to uh, last but not least, the asynchronous pr processing. If you understand that not all the requests you are handling requires the immediate response, and uh, if the number of requests grows in number significantly and the throughput of your application is not there and you, you want to improve that, you may employ different uh, techniques, different uh, patterns with different tools. And we will cover that a little bit later in different section of this application to have uh, non-real-time operations. Probably you don't need them. You can uh, just go and have them in the background task. And that will allow to free resource for the immediate operations that needs to take place here and, and, and now for your users. And that also will uh, improve the scalability of your application and which is more important, will make your applications reliable, more reliable at least. So you not usually need, or maybe you need that dependence, uh, depending on the case that we are solving all of these five things uh, together and you can just, uh, mishmash them in a different combination, uh, take one, take three, take all five of them. But if you combine them right uh, in, in the case you're trying to solve, uh, I bet you'll have a really scalable solution uh, for the system you are designing. The communication chaos. That's the another things we have to go through. And when we're talking about the communication chaos, we are not talking about uh, the communication chaos between your uh, engineering manager uh, and your product manager and the team lead and, and, and team itself. No, we're talking about the system to system communication and what we had to do to avoid this chaos. First of all, the service-to-service -service communication, the, one of the most uh, famous and uh, default stuff we are doing on our day-to-day -day jobs. So we employ different RESTful APIs, message queues, event-driven architectures, and it's crucial to define clear API contracts using the standards open, like open API or uh, things that GraphQL provides you to document interfaces that you expose for the internal use. This, this will ensure that all the services within your big system probably know how to communicate with one another. 
And that helps a lot, especially when you get back to your code that you have been written two weeks ago and you don't really remember what that code does. And that applies to the APIs. You don't need to recall if you had a, a clear API uh, description that's, that helps not only your teammates, but you in some time. Uh, you want to have things like service discovery and service registry for like a modern application when the dynamic that when the environment is dynamic when you uh, have the services can come and go because you won't have auto scalable solutions when when they go high in numbers when the demand is high and they can stop doing things and shut down when the, there is no demand for them. So you won't have to have a tools like console or Eureka or GTCD, whatever you name it. Uh, to register your services and not to hard code any things like uh, specific API addresses. You don't want to hard code endpoints. You just have to give them a name in the registry and service discovery after discover them. Uh, so that's the simple things for most of you, I believe. But that's the important things not to forget mention when you're designing things. Uh, and we're getting back to things that is asynchronous commu communication uh, because we oftenly want to have that in our application. And we usually use some message queues or pop-up systems like Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ. And we help of those tools, with help of those services, we can decouple our own services. And by decoupling our own services, we remove the hard dependency between those services. Again, having the clearly documented IPIs, how they communicate with one another. So with that, we achieve the better throughput, with that, we achieve the better resilience. So that the things we want to have in our system from time to time. Uh, and as for the learning itself, for the application, it is crucial to fail fast and not to have the cascade fails that are propagated to all different services or different uh, sub systems of our big application, big system. So we want to have something that will fail fast and stop failing in that isolated environment and not to propagate those things to the users, especially to the users. So what will help to do that as the circuit break it and retries. Employ them, shut down your servers uh, that are failing when they're failing and in the place that they are failing and then have the retry mechanism to understand whether the services go back live and you can understand and you can then uh, allow other parts of your system to communicate with this again healthy uh, service that was failing before uh, very important things the monitoring and the logging talk about that like go through that because having the robust monitoring and logging system allows you to understand when and why the certain things breaks and they will break eventually all of the time. So you don't want to have like console lock in your app. Obviously you want to understand what happened and why it happened. And it will narrows the uh, investigation areas you need to dive in to understand and fix the problems. So have that in your system and talk through that during your system design. And again, documentation and collaboration with one another. That's not about that again, not about the system itself, but then that is about the people. You want to have the centralized place when you can put all the documentation and probably you want that documentation to be meaningful and gives you an, like a brief understanding what the system you're building is doing and why it is doing that way, because that happens all the time. The people come and go. There is a new team members in your team. There is uh, another team that want to understand how your system was built and why it was built in such a way to uh, be able to integrate with that system. And without the good documentation, you, you just uh, will spend so many time on, on explaining simple things and recalling those simple things uh, before explaining them. The security things is always on the list when it comes to the system design. And it, it, it probably will take another conference talk to, to, to go through all the security issues that can happen to your application. So we'll be very, very fast limiting ourselves to the three key security considerations that are 
uh, important during your system design interview, especially. So the thing between authentication and authorization, you have to understand how the users will interact with your system and maybe with one another, how you will allow users to interact with your system and one another. Will you employ any role model mechanism in your system? Uh, do you need that roles in your system and how you will ensure having that? What integrations that will require you to, to have maybe OAuth 2 or stuff like that in your system when you're designing it? Uh, encryption, you want to have your uh, data encrypted, you want to have your data in REST and transit to be encrypted. And there is a place again to make a decision what encryption mechanism you want to use. Uh, the heavier it takes the, the longer it will take to proce process the data, to encrypt the data, uh, and to decrypt the data into this, in the destination point when you want uh, to, to have it. So that's the things you had to decide, and that's probably the part you want to mention during your system design interview. And also you had to mention a secure design practices, you know, because there is so much things that can go wrong. Maybe the SQL injection is not on the list right now for the language like Java, and I just prefer Java to all other languages. But things like buffer and flow and XSS scripting is like on the list, and you want to probably delegate the job to someone else, like SNCC, or maybe you want to employ some uh, Sonar Cube uh, when you're deploying stuff as a step of your CI CD pipelines that will check for some vulnerabilities and stuff like that. So that probably the answer that will satisfy more on the, uh, most of the interviewers during your interview process that you will employ some specialized tool for covering that stuff. And finally, having all those three things together, we can we can have it. We can have the system design like answered. Let's let's call it that way. Finished. So we we done the back of envelope estimation. We manage our priorities. We do the trade off analysis. What we should pick here and there. Uh, we get a beer or any other alcohol of your choice, and we are ready to crack the system design interior. But learning the basics and learning the things uh, that uh, we just passed by is not enough to be a good uh, architect, let's call it, uh, or someone who do the system design, like basically all of it, all of engineers. And Sandra perfectly understand that. So like uh, you need to mastering those things. You need to practice all the things. And Besides learning the basics, besides knowing all the stuff about load balancing and caching strategies and stuff like that, we need to pass our final task. And our final task is actually a test task that we need to perform. It is the something which most of us fear the most. It's the design of tiny URL. It's very, uh, usual questions that happens during system design to you but i personally like this question i stop i stop asking this to be uh really fair with you guys but for the year or so i was asking this question because there is so many possibilities this question can lead to so many answers so many things that require that that can be um, granularly explained during the interview phase and things we can know and each time uh, you can as even interviewer can learn something new about this design because there is many talented engineers that uh, suggest very clever and uh, unusual ideas how to deal with this simple yet interesting task so what we are looking for when we design in the, the, the tiny euro things so i i believe i don't have to explain but i will do anyway so you want to go to some sort of web page and you will have some very uh nice ui design where you can type in the form the euro you want press sort of button generate or go or whatever it will call or just enter and you will receive the short url of like limited symbols back to you and you can obviously will type the uh, youtube video of the of, of the of the cats what else 
use that that service for and you can use this short url to pass this cat's video to your friends in the slack in the in the other chats in the signal whatever you're using so a uh, user can store the url somewhere the user can obviously want obviously read that and uh, to my understanding the reading is eventually consistent here so at some point the the, the the redirection should have happened and any there are any other non-functional requirements there let's let's see because you know the talk is cheap so let's uh jump to the another part of the presentation let's let's take a look at the system design itself it's it's really silly it's really easy but let's go through that so the functional requirement we just talked through so we stopped and the non-functional requirements that can be applied to uh to this system so we are thinking about what we can think about 10 million users that would be read our system every day and for writing or creating the the short links we think that uh, each day it would be not, uh, not no more than 10000 of those short things created so what first come to our mind when we gather this requirements from on our systems and interview from from our customer or our interviewer that the system is basically a read heavy but not write heavy but to prove that and understand what we actually need from that system let's do some back of the envelope estimations so we had like 10 million users uh, and we had uh, 1440 minutes per day so we can divide that 10 millions by that number and by 60 seconds which are present in each minute and we will get 116 queries per second the read queries that our system has to handle that's not this like outstanding or a scary number but still it's like not small number let's phrase it that way so potentially uh, a database like Postgres could comfortably handle those queries if done right. In addition, we can employ some sort of LRU cache to avoid too many disconnections. And also we can read the Stack Overflow or we can type that into Bing or ChatGPT about what is the best practices to tune our database server uh, to serve those simple read requests in the best fashion. Uh, obviously, we will probably uh, go for an SSD uh, disk to handle this, this operation if we're talking about this, uh, the relational database. What about the reads? Let's do the simple math again. Uh, so we had like 10K uh, generation of those short links. We again have this, the same number for minutes per day and the seconds in one minute. So that will end up being less than one care query per second that we will be dealing with. That's really not something any nowadays system has to worry about. So we can say that uh, probably we have, we can and have to split those two functionalities into different services. So one service uh, will be uh, res uh, responsible for writing things and one th uh, service will be responsible for reading things uh again what we can do here is not to generate those uh, short links or short short uh tiny urls uh ad hoc at place when the request is happening because it's not really wise it uh, because the, the we're not touching the mechanism of how to generate those things because there is a lot of uh, things we can employ, a base64 conversion, uh, some UUD generation, some hashing mechanism, depending on the outcome we are desiring uh, to achieve and the length of the short URL we are allowed to have in our system. But again, let's imagine that we had that transforming and creation mechanism in place. Uh, there is no reason to uh, call it every time the request happens for creation of the um, of the short euro. We can have some sort of uh, 
delegated creation and we can have the pool of those UU, UIDs, let's, let's call them IDs, somewhere with, within our system. And when, let's say, two, three of these uh, hashes or IDs in the pool would be used, we just can generate another batch of those UIDs. And then we are not dealing with generation each time that request happens. We just take the new and not used ID from the pool and use it. That's much more convenient than to generate things. I, I hope you agree with that. Again, our system is not very heavy. It's only have two APIs. And I strongly suggest you to go for designing that API during the interview because it's simple. It still allows you to write it in very short manner. It doesn't require you too much uh, job to be done. And it allows you to think about different things. Maybe you missed something. So you can, first of all, use that time writing the simple thing to think beforehand what will happen next, what you'll talk next. And it also will help you to understand whether you missed any, miss anything in your original design. Is your piece clear enough? Uh, maybe you need to, to come back and change anything. So in our case, it's relatively simple. We have like two uh, endpoints, one for the get that will use ID that we will generate within our system to perform the redirect in our browser. And the one with the post that will actually do the job and returns this new tiny URL to our user. Simple enough. And uh, if you're good with that, with if the interviewer is good with that, and remember the interviewer on the interview is your friend, is not there to uh, manifest any things or superiority or, um, you know, uh, be a better than you and the interview. That's not the case. That's not the reason to do that. Uh, the interview should help you during the interview. Uh, so talk to them and ask if they are happy with what they see with all the back of the envelope estimation, with all the reasonable uh, and, and reasons you, you just put on the table with all the API design and stuff like that. If they are happy, you can proceed to, to visualizing that using the like online tool, using the whiteboard, whatever. So let's 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 jump to that. Very simple. Again, you don't have to write uh, and paint a very complicated uh, things like no Picasso paintings. That there's no needed for that. So you can simply say, okay, we'll have the users. We'll have that some sort of uh, API gateway based on the geographical locations just to navigate between uh, the proper. Uh, read your URL service because probably there will be a load balancer there. Uh, so we will navigate the read request to one one service, then we'll have the, uh, the the read service. So for the for the right, we'll have the store URL service or something that that will connect with the pool of generated hashes, and then eventually the generated. Uh, short URL will end up in the relational database. And as I said, we might employ Postgres for that. Why not? And we were not talking about authorization, authentication in this case, because probably we don't have uh, enough time to cover those stuff. And probably the interviewers would not be very interested in that. Uh, again, we are not talking about uh, for how long the uh, this, this hashes would be enough and if you do a math calculation, you'll end up with really big numbers and you had to not to worry about with simple UAD generation even. Um, again, this is a very simple scenario. This is a very simple design that you can come up in a matter of 15, 20 minutes. And you can start with that. That's, that doesn't mean that this is the ideal thing. This thing is something you can later talk with your interview interviewer to understand what part of the system requires improvement, what improvements you need to adjust to the system based on, on the business scenario that may come into force later during the interview. So the first thing from the technical perspective, you might think of, well, uh, how I'm using the rational database here because like for one table only, it's not really rational. Like what we have here is something that is a key value. Yeah, we have the ID and we have the corresponding original URL that is a value of that key. So why not using a key value storage and 
what comes to mind first when I think about simple, yet very performant and persistent key value storage. Well, for me, it is Redis. So we can just simply replace the Postgres or any relational database with the Redis, for instance. Can we do that? Definitely can. Should we do that? That depends on where the interview course is leading to. So that is the foundation that you can and probably will use when you talking about different system design. And this is the mock of any system design question that you will encounter in your life. Because that is what all the system design interviews are made of. So you have to require, uh, gather the requirements, understand the non-functional and functional requirements. You have to perf perform some sort of estimation on the things you want to use, on the things that you will use and why you use the certain things inside of your system. You will design the IPIs one, two, three, uh, depending on the complexity and cruciality of those endpoints within your system and for your design. And then you'll write down and paint something like this just to give you yourself first of all and then the interviewer the understanding how you will combine all the things that you just mentioned before into one big picture and present it so let's get jump to the uh to our original presentation because dr zombie is feeling lonely here so Sandro gets the victory, obviously, that's, that's the test task. Why shouldn't he? Uh, the tiny URL is defeated, obviously. But that happens really usually. The hiring manager said, okay, you did great, but you know, you didn't fit the organization culture, whatever that means. So that just happens. Sorry for that. But we will get back to you if we'll find anything more related to your experience anyway soon. So that's it for our system design interview course or also system design. You can employ and use this thing, whatever you want during your interviews. And I suggest you going for the interviews because that what keeps you in shape, what gives you understanding what is important on the market right here and right now. It helps you to keep yourself in mood to be, to be better and become better from like each day from learning from those interviews, even those were a fail because it, it, it will sometimes be a fail and you should not be uh, devastated by that fact. You learn something new, you fail fast, you important is to get the feedback, what was wrong, how it was wrong, what was expected and pass it through yourself and learn from that. So if you mortals have any questions right here, and I believe we had like five or, or four minutes left, which is ideal case, I hope, uh, you can fire those questions for me. Thank you very much. And that's a capybara for you. Hi, Yuri. Hello, and uh, thank you for bringing me back to the presentation. So thank you very much for <laughs> this was an unexpected slide deck. I see that you're you're the fan of the heroes, uh, heroes of Mag Mag magic series. So which one is the best one in your opinion? Uh, you mean the, the, the number of which one is? The best? Yes, the, 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 the surge, right? Or, or is it something else? Like uh, you, you, you I believe everyone from the slides and the set <laughs> understand that the third is the best one. And I wouldn't oh, answer the force to this question, even if I do find some mechanics of the fourth edition of the heroes fascinating and interesting. Mm. The so, unpopular opinion. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it's the beginning of the January, the end of the day, right? So, but coming back <laughs> to the um, to the presentation that uh, you just shared, amazing yeah, thoughts, sure. by the way. So. Um, when you are conducting interview, I think it's, it's a important question for everybody. What are the key aspects that you're looking at the system design interview when the candidate is presenting their solution that might or might not be technologically and technically perfect? Mm -hmm. What are the key aspects that you will be looking for in the perfect candidate who would be passing it? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's an interesting question. And I was, uh, um, hoping to find the answer to these questions for a long period of time. And I hope I find one and I will generalize it a little bit. 
I'm looking into adaptability of the engineers because the IT industry and computer science itself, and you can, you can understand that from the topic, the general topic of our uh, conference right here right now, the IE is it a friend or is it a four? It, it's changing and it's changing rapidly and be able to adapt to the new environment, to the new challenges is something which distinguish a regular engineer from a good engineer. And that is something we can showcase during the system design interview. If you fire the right questions to your candidate, if you're trying to get him or her from the comfort zone, uh, not following the main line of the topic, like a tiny URL, but maybe stepping into the site, like questioning, okay, how we will build this pool of hashes or mm -hmm. IDs there, why we will do that and, and stuff like that. So there is a, a literally, the, I, I never run a prepared questions before the interview. That's, I, I see the candidate, I s get familiar with the person and I'm trying to act uh, according to the person I'm talking to. So it's very personalized experience. And based on that personalized experience, I'm trying to ask the right questions. So the, the, the answer uh, to summarize things is the ability to adapt to the changing environment. So basically, even if somebody has just um, went through the presentation and they know exactly how to design the teeny, tiny URL and they come to your interview, you will still check like, what if what if now this is not only the t t tiny URL, but you need to add statistics on top of that and be BI on top of that. Definitely. Definitely. Right? If uh, and, and as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm stop asking this question because it was too much of that. Uh, but in the end, yeah, the, the mm, like uh, fascinating thing about the specifically tiny URL is how many things you can add on top of that. So how you will monetize the system. You can ask this question. Is it important for the engineer to answer the business questions and challenges? It's very important. That's again, what distinguished like the, the programmer and developer from the engineer. Yeah. And again, you mentioned the statistics, how we will gather them, when we will gather them, will we store it like this way or another, how we will present the statistic, what we can, uh, uh, what will we use that statistics for? So there is a uh, like bunch of things around the main questions that can be added, and they are probably more important than the original question itself. Oh, right. That uh, that does sound great. Yes, uh, this uh, adaptability aspect is pretty much representing the real life because in software projects, I know maybe almost zero projects that um, did not evolve in uh, in the process of making it, right? So you start designing a spaceship that will be carrying the moon rocks and all of a sudden you need to carry liquids and the aliens that only breathe the helium on the board, right? That's that's the typical software project. That all we have, all right? the projects should evolve, otherwise they are, there's a question why they are there, who, who using them. And all the projects will break eventually because if your project is not breaking, again, nobody's using that project. So Definitely. you had to adapt, you had to make changes from time to time. And uh, the important things for the architecture itself is what I call the liquid architecture. You had to love yourself, make a mistake. So the good architect can incorporate those mistakes on the early stages to be easy to maintain and fixed later on when the bad things happen. So that's really, again, a very, that's, that's the, another level of architecture and things. Not only the mistakes, I guess, also the uncertainties. At some point in time, yeah, you know that there definitely. is something yeah. that we don't know, right? Um, yeah, my next question sure. would be about the technologies, the specific ones, right? So you mentioned Redis mm -hmm. as the cache or um, there yeah, are just like, a couple of famous um, names. Yes, gazillion of those, right? And uh, yeah. Um, it's probably impossible these days for a, a sane human being to, to keep track of everything. So how much do you think it is valuable for the person who is doing the system design, not the actual development, to, to say, hey, I need cache here, but I don't just need cache. It will be specifically Redis, or I just need the cache that will be in memory fast enough, will be able to handle 10,000 uh, calls within the hour or within the uh, minute. Um, so how much in-depth understanding of the technology itself is valuable versus it's you just need to know in general terms it's mongodb it's no sequel it can work in clusters right 
Yeah, but again, as all in uh, in IT, it depends. Yeah, depending on what type of questions you're trying to answer. Uh, at some point of time, when you're designing things from scratch, probably something like in memory things that do blah 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 is fine enough because, like, uh, knowing nowadays in 2023, knowing the information and knowing what to find about that information is basically like five or 15 seconds, depending on how fast can you type in the Google or in ChatGPT. The answer will be there. You just need to know what the question you have to ask. So that's the important things, knowing which questions you want to ask. And that's what, what questions you want to ask your system, what system will answer them and how the system will answer them. So definitely you had to know some couple of famous things and you will obviously know them because they are a buzzword. You will you will stack upon them one in in relevant. You want to stop stumble upon them or you don't. Yeah, you will eventually know about Redis. You will eventually know about Cassandra. You eventually hear about the Mongo. The, the but the most important thing is to ask the right questions and explain why you will use a certain. Uh, features or specific technologies rather than the technology itself. Um, and I think we'd still have a time for one more uh, question, and that will be sure, in the context of uh, <laughs> yes, in the context of this whole conference, right? So I know there are some experiments already um, with the right degrees of success to make AI. Um, sketch or design certain systems like I saw the prompts like here you have a system that will accept insolvent users and these users will have to manage their to-do lists can you please suggest what are the components of the system that well you would put together um, in in your view do you think there is a future in um, this type of analysis uh, that is not maybe it's it's not it's, it's, it's not a straightforward, right? So there are systems that require some additional creativity. Do you think that AI will be at some point a real help for the architect to say, hey, I'm not sure which which one to put here, which which technology would you recommend, or how should I uh, organize the um, exchange between these two distributed services? Do you think there is a future in uh, this area or it will still remain um, a responsibility of a human being to make those decisions because they mm -hmm. are crucial for the system? Mm -hmm. Uh, I hope it will remind the human's responsibility. Why? Because I believe the uh, system design and architecture is a sort of an art. It requires some a spark of creation from the human being. So if you ask the system, a pretty stupid system, if you get to what the LLM systems like are in the nutshell, uh, to asking these questions, I don't know what is best in this like particular situation. You cannot judge what is best. You're probably employing not the right role for yourself. So my opinion and my vision on this question is that I personally use a chat GPT. I personally use the uh, many other tools to help me day to day basis to do like boring job like uh, completing the documentation, writing it down, uh, checking whether my English is okay or not, stuff like that. Probably all of us use that stuff. And that's great because that saved me a lot of time to make a decision. The machine will never be responsible for that decision. And like being responsible for the decision is something the human being can only uh, do right now. So it should remain as that, in my personal opinion. That's definitely a good view on, on the future. And also, yes, uh, I do share that opinion, definitely. So um, I guess I'll take one more question from the chat uh, just arrived recently. So what are some resources, some books or otherwise would you recommend for somebody who, uh, who wants to learn deeper about the art of um, system design? Uh, I suggest uh, Alex, uh, Alex Yu uh, newsletter about the system design. Uh, and he, yes, he had a, fa a fantastic book about that. Uh, this one, yep, yep. System design interview, first and second edition, cool books. Uh, highly recommend that stuff. And uh, rocking the system design interview, the course and the, the book itself is also very important. But uh, that's, that's for the like, oh, 
uh, old school learners, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, for the for the new generation, there is a lot of the information over the internet. AWS uh, frequently share like five to f to seven minutes video on different uh, clients they have on their platform, how they build certain things. Obviously, with the help of the AWS, because that's that's the marketing videos. But by the end of the day, you will get an ideas from those videos, and that's important to 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 understand. Okay, that's the problem they've been solving, and that's what services they were using, and that's why these services were employed to fix particular challenge or problem they were facing. And there is a lot of things that different companies, the, the Azure do the same stuff, the Oracle do the same stuff. So you can find this. Uh, interesting materials, live materials, uh, probably more fascinating rather than reading the, the boring books, which these books are not. These books that we share, this, they are outstanding and I highly recommend them. They, they are pretty good. I can definitely confirm that. Those are interesting use cases. So thank you very much for the presentation. Now we're definitely running out of time, but I'm pretty sure that there will be some quite a few follow-ups probably with the additional questions about how to pass the interviews properly and how to master your system design um, skills. So thank you very yeah. much for joining. Thank this you conference. for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. See you guys. Take care.